It's a busy Friday morning in the African city of Nairobi. Then, the air is shattered by a massive explosion. A huge bomb detonates outside the American embassy, demolishing a neighboring seven-story building. Hundreds of people are buried and thousands injured in the worst terrorist act to hit the African continent. Now, using advanced computer simulations, we reveal exactly what happened, who set this bomb off, and how they did it. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Africa. Kenya. Nairobi, the heart of Central East Africa. This is one of the largest cities in the area. Here, East meets West, while nearly two million people from all over Africa rub shoulders with the rest of the world. In 1998, Prudence Bushnell is the U.S. ambassador to Kenya, and she's aware of the problems in the area. Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Jews, a huge number of different kinds of people. Ambassador Bushnell works here in the U.S. Embassy in central Nairobi. Like all American embassies, it's built to be tough. The walls are made of reinforced concrete. It stands five stories tall, has an underground parking garage, and can withstand an earthquake. It's the largest U.S. embassy in the region. Next door is a seven-story office building with no connection to the embassy. Nearly 400 Kenyans work here in the Ufundi building every day. Towering over everything else is a cooperative bank 21 stories high and a distinctive local landmark. August 7th, 1998, 7.15 a.m. George Memba says goodbye to his wife, Nancy. He keeps the computers at the U.S. Embassy running smoothly, and today he's traveling to an IT conference. I am looking forward to this conference. It's a good chance to meet uh, your systems counterparts, to share ideas, share problems, I mean, get to, know, get to meet the new faces. George misses Nancy when he travels on business. He always returns with a present in hand. She knows I have to at least bring her something. <laughs> so she doesn't ask me to, but it's, uh, I just go ahead. I know that it's my obligation when I come back at least to come back with something. On his way to the airport, he needs to stop at the embassy to send some last minute emails. On the outskirts of Nairobi, two men leave an ordinary suburban house and drive a truck into the city. Their destination is the American Embassy. By 9.30, the streets around the embassy are getting crowded. At the back of the embassy, security guard Joe Shokindo guards the rear gate. He's feeling a little under the weather. I was tired. Something came on my mind. I was feeling tired, and a thought came to my mind. Don't go to work. Then, as I mowed over it, I thought, why shouldn't I go? If I don't go, I will not eat. I will not eat. Josh has the key to the embassy's rear gate. In front of the gate is a drop barrier to prevent cars from driving up to the entrance. Josh is surprised to see Ambassador Prudence Bushnell coming out of the embassy so early. She's going to a meeting in the cooperative tower across the alleyway. Josh locks the gate behind them. The truck noses its way through the traffic and merges onto one of the freeways circling central Nairobi. It exits onto a roundabout that leads to the road where the embassy is located. It merges into the left-hand lane, ready to make the turn.
At 9.55, scrap metal merchant Sammy Nyana heads towards his second floor office inside the Ufundi building. This is just one of several jobs he has to support his wife and three children. He doesn't notice Rose, the tea server, as she goes by. He's more worried about an important meeting he has today. I went to get some photocopies done and run some other office errands because we had a business meeting at 10 o'clock. At the top of the cooperative tower, Prudence Bushnell observes a meeting between the Kenyan trade minister and two of her colleagues from the U.S. Department of Commerce. At 10.10, the truck turns left and drives the last half mile to its destination, the embassy. Meanwhile, computer manager George Mimba heads up to his office. He sits down to write some last minute emails. As he does, the truck reaches the embassy. It swerves off the road and drives down the slip road, narrowly missing a car coming the other way as it heads toward the rear gate. Josh is at the gate with the key in his pocket. When he sees the truck speeding towards him, he knows something's wrong. A man leaps from the passenger seat of the truck and shouts at the guards to open the gate. Josh tries to stall him. He says he doesn't have the key to the gate, even though it's in his pocket, and he has to call someone to get it. But instead of calling for the keys, Josh calls for help on the embassy radio. But he doesn't get the answer he expects. Hello, hello. The man on the other end thinks he's joking and tells him to get off the network. Josh and his colleague are on their own. The man at the gate goes back to talk to the driver. But they don't realize that Josh can hear everything they're saying. This fellow spoke with the driver and told him, this fellow has no keys. Talk to him calmly. If he refuses, use your pistol. Now Josh knows the embassy is under attack. Seconds from Disaster will continue. And now back to Seconds from Disaster. It's 10.39 a.m. and a dangerous situation is unfolding at the back gate of the American Embassy in Nairobi. Security guard Josh Okindo realizes the men at the gate plan to kill him. The driver pulls a gun. His accomplice hurls a grenade. George thinks he hears an earth tremor. As the grenade explodes, Sammy Nyana and many others rush to the window. Up in the cooperative tower, Prudence Bushnell's meeting is interrupted by the noise. George is torn between finishing his email and joining the others at the embassy's rear window. George, Sammy, Prudence. Just three of the hundreds of people alerted by the noise. Now the driver steers the truck straight at the fence. As rescuers arrive, they're confronted by total chaos. The force of the huge blast has brought the Ufundi building crashing to the ground. Hundreds of Kenyan civilians who have nothing to do with the embassy have been killed or seriously injured. Next door, at the top of the cooperative tower, Prudence Bushnell regains consciousness. She helps an injured colleague out of the room toward the exit. As they stagger down endless flights of stairs, Prudence can see bloody and injured people everywhere. I think to myself, I just need to get out of this building 
and back to my embassy, and I will be all right. But as she steps outside, it's apparent that things will not be all right. What I'm seeing are shards of glass, twisted steel, and then the burnt corpse of what was once a human being. That causes me to look up, and I see the back of my embassy, which is missing. Next door, people frantically dig through tons of rubble in an attempt to save the victims buried in the collapse. Beneath the rubble, Sammy strikes a match. He sees he's trapped in an air pocket only four feet wide. The building has collapsed, and he's lying under hundreds of tons of rubble. His legs are broken, and the only thing that saves him from being crushed to death is the stairwell. Thoughts start racing in my mind. If I survive this situation, how am I going to live with a broken leg? How will my children be? In the front section of the embassy, George Mimba wakes up. He has a concussion and is completely confused. You don't know where you are. You don't know what's happened. You're just there. In the smoke and the dust, he has no idea which direction to go. He just has to get out. Finally, he reaches the edge of the building and looks out at the pandemonium. From the second floor, all he can see is destruction. I had the world has come to an end, or Nairobi as a town has been bombed. George is convinced that the embassy is about to collapse, so he makes a rash decision. He closes his eyes and throws himself off of a ledge. You're watching Seconds from Disaster. As dazed survivors stumble around the wreckage of the bombed buildings in Nairobi, it becomes clear that this is not an isolated event. Good morning, everyone. As we are reporting, massive explosions at two U.S. embassies in East African countries this morning. The United States Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya, has been heavily damaged. In Tanzania, witnesses say that two-thirds of the U.S. embassies in Dar es Salaam was destroyed. This is a coordinated attack against U.S. embassies in Africa. Americans go into full lockdown siege mode. No one is allowed into either embassy except to help the seriously injured. Hundreds of Kenyan commuters have rushed to the wreckage of the Ufundi building to help in the rescue efforts. Beneath the rubble, Sami Nyana can hear them frantically working above but he has lost all track of time. One hour seemed like five hours. If 15 minutes passed without you hitting the rescues, it felt like a whole day. Suddenly, he hears shouting. Hello? Hello? It's another survivor trapped in the rubble nearby. Her name is Rose. She serves tea in the Ufundi building. When the building collapsed, the boiling hot water for her tea splashed all over her face and burned her. I started thinking, can anyone survive this? George has survived his fall without serious injuries, but he's still in shock. I thought I'm in a different world. I thought I died. I don't believe what I'm hearing because does it mean that I survive? He takes in the devastation around him, then heads back into the building to help his injured colleagues. These are my people. I've left everybody 
I know in the building. I have to go in there. He makes his way back to his wrecked office. Hello? Is anybody here? Bodies Hello? are everywhere. Hello? Is anybody here? Is anybody here? Disheartened, George turns away. But then... Hello? A woman calls his name. As he fumbles through the darkness, he feels for survivors but all he can sense is the stillness of those who perished. But then, one of them moves. George, almost overcome by the fumes, helps his stricken colleague out of the room. It's only later that he realizes he's rescued a man and not the woman who cried out to him. But he can't go back because the stairs have collapsed. George's heroic action was captured on film. But to this day, he doesn't know the name of the woman who called out to him. And the moment still haunts him, especially on the anniversary of the bombing. That moment is one moment I would normally dread. When any time the August 7th comes in, it, the voice comes very clearly now. And she called out my name. Why did I have to let her die? That is one thing I will never, ever forgive myself. August 8th, 1039. 24 hours after the bomb exploded, hundreds of rescuers still dig through the rubble for survivors. They've heard Sammy calling for help in the basement, and a rescue unit tunnels towards him. But they need to get there fast. Sammy and Rose have been stuck underground for more than a day. And Rose is starting to fade. Okay. People are coming. Sammy does everything he can to keep her spirits up, but the effort is exhausting. After 36 hours, rescuers finally break through to the hole where Sammy is trapped. But it's much more difficult to rescue Rose. She's trapped between the underground safe of the bank and the elevator. It's what protected her from the falling rubble. But now it's almost impossible to get her out. Sammy calls out to her as he's lifted to safety. We spoke, and I told her everything is all right. I am going, and before an hour is over, even you will be out of this place. He's carried out of the hole on a stretcher and rushed to the hospital. But Rose is still trapped in the wreckage. Her husband, Lawrence, knows she's still alive. He maintains a lonely vigil next to the disaster zone. He's still alive and they are trying to retrieve her. So I'm uh, still on the set, waiting to see how it's moving. It takes another three days before rescuers finally get through to Rose. When they do, they discover that she has succumbed to her injuries. Her tragic death, along with the death of so many others, causes an entire nation to mourn. The Nairobi Embassy bombing is the most devastating act of terrorism to hit Africa. But who did it? Why did so many people die? And will the bombers strike again? Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened. Special Agent Don Sackleben is the chief examiner of the forensic team sent to assist FBI agents in the field. He has worked on major terrorist incidents like Oklahoma City and the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. That morning when I woke up, I turned on the news and saw the coverage from both Nairobi and Dar es Salaam and knew that somebody was going to Africa that day. 
It takes two days for Don and his team to reach Nairobi from their base in Washington, D.C. But the scene is still buzzing with activity. There were rescue workers everywhere, still pulling people from the rubble. I knew that my job was to stay out of their way. Don and his team have to wait until the site is cleared before they can gather evidence. But Don takes advantage of the time to get an overall view of the situation. It's a bit like a mosaic tile. The closer you look at it, it's just a bunch of colored tiles. But as you step back, you can start to see the picture form. Looking at the damage from the air, it's obvious that a massive bomb was used to cause devastation on this scale. The only realistic way you can get that quantity of explosives to a bomb site is with a large vehicle like a truck. A bomb this size can leave vital clues at the scene of the crime, clues that could lead directly to the killers. So his team needs to swab the site as soon as possible to help investigators isolate what kind of explosive was used. If it's, say, TNT, that could lead the investigators in one direction versus a homemade fertilizer type bomb, which might be a completely different set of leads to follow. Looking at the scene, Don sees the type of damage usually caused by a high velocity explosive like TNT. He shares his hunch with his FBI colleagues, but it'll take a lot of painstaking work to confirm these first impressions. All the investigators can do is start piecing together a picture of what happened. They start by talking to witnesses, and quickly, they learn that gunshots and small blasts were heard before the main explosion. Then, one more crucial fact emerges, and it confirms the FBI's worst fears. At least one man was seen running away from the truck before it exploded. A terrorist is still at large, and the race is on to find him before he strikes again. We'll and now, back to seconds from disaster. A terrorist bomber is at large in Nairobi, and the FBI is still hunting for clues. Don Sackleben is the chief forensic examiner of the FBI team. He has to find out what type of truck was used in the bombing and where it came from. This would provide a crucial forensic lead to the men who planned the bombing. But piecing the truck together isn't going to be easy. Don's team has to sort through more than 600 car parts scattered throughout the wreckage, a needle in a haystack. Actually, they're more like looking for a needle in a stack of needles, because everything there is rubble. Everything is, is twisted metal. And that's not the only thing they have to find. They also have to find the gun used by the bombers at the scene. Well, my initial reaction is, how am I going to find evidence of a shooting at a big bomb scene? It's just silly. Don has to get the evidence to a place where he and his team can start going through it. He directs the bulldozers to scoop up the wreckage and transport it to a railway yard across the road. But now there's another problem. Busy Kenyan commuters are trampling all over the evidence on their way to work. Nevertheless, Don's team quickly gets down to the crucial job of identifying the truck. It seems like an impossible task. But over the years, Don and his colleagues have blown up a few trucks of their own. Our unit has conducted a number of tests to see what the effect of an explosion, a large explosion, is on a vehicle. These are some of the pieces I've brought back from those tests. They really help us to understand how the damage to that vehicle occurs versus damage to other things that are around it. Don knows that the metal components of a car react differently depending upon their distance from the bomb. This piece was actually, I think, 50 or so feet away from the explosion. 
So you can see the directionality of it, how the blast wave tore it in one direction, as opposed to this piece, which is actually wrapped around from the way the explosion just curled around it. This allows Don and his team to pinpoint which of the thousands of pieces of debris came from the bomb truck rather than from vehicles nearby. When they start looking, they find pieces that have obviously come from the bomb truck. At the same time, at least three eyewitnesses can identify the truck they saw at the gate. It's called a canter truck. So I asked the logical question, what's a canter truck? And it turns out it's a Mitsubishi product. The Mitsubishi canter is a common truck in Kenya, but the pieces of the truck that Don's team is finding don't come from a canter. The evidence Don has contradicts everything he's being told. Could the FBI's techniques be flawed? But then, Don's team finds part of a pistol in the debris. Since the guards weren't armed, this has to be part of the gun used by the bomber. The part is called a gun slide. If it can be traced back to its owners, it'll provide an important lead to the terrorists. All they need is an identification number. Unfortunately, this slide doesn't have any identifying numbers on it. Without any ID numbers, Don can't trace the pistol back to its owners. And if he can't trace it back to its owners, the gun is useless. To add to the setbacks of the truck and gun, Don now finds out that his team won't be able to collect any DNA evidence from the bomber's remains. Unfortunately, the sheer volume of casualties in Nairobi really prevented us from being able to isolate the pieces that might have come from the suicide bomber. The forensic investigation team has a lot of questions and very few answers. They have a bomber on the run, a gun that can't help them, and a mystery truck they can't pin down. The truck problem is particularly frustrating. Eyewitnesses reported seeing a Mitsubishi canter, but there aren't any pieces of a canter in the wreckage. Desperate, Don calls in a local car dealer to see if he can help identify the pieces. The man confirms what he suspected all along. The bits of the bomb truck don't come from a Mitsubishi after all. So why did everyone believe it was a Mitsubishi canter? An off-the-cuff comment unlocks the mystery. It turns out that in Nairobi, every truck of this kind is called a canter. It's a bit of a shorthand. So it really pays to bring in some local knowledge. But still, the evidence is contradictory, and the eyewitness reports aren't helping. Some people said it was a left-hand drive vehicle. Other people said it's a right-hand drive vehicle. So as a forensic scientist, I've got to try to find something that really proves that one way or the other. This crucial piece of information will help Don narrow the search. He turns to one of the recovered pieces, a Pittman arm. Now, a Pittman arm is in the front of a vehicle, and if it's a right-hand drive vehicle, it's mounted in one orientation. If it's a left-hand drive vehicle, it's mounted in the opposite orientation. The Pittman arm from the bomb scene had damage all along one side, which indicated that it was pointing to the right. This proved that it was a right-hand drive vehicle. So at least I was able to make a contribution and say, stop looking for left-hand drive vehicles. But the team is still at a loss. If they can't identify what type of vehicle it was, their most promising forensic lead will be a dead end. Then, a local office worker comes in with a piece of truck that actually landed on his desk during the explosion. By an extraordinary stroke of luck, it has the vehicle's identification number on it. It's only partial, but it's enough to identify the truck. Not as a Mitsubishi Cantor, but something similar, a Toyota Dyna. This breakthrough points investigators to a seaport 310 miles south of Nairobi. Many trucks like this are imported through this harbor, the port of Mombasa. To track down this particular truck, investigators will have to sift through all the import documents for Toyota trucks in the past few months, and there are boxes of paperwork. Eventually, their perseverance pays off. 
they traced the truck to a poultry farmer in Mombasa who sold it to a man named Ahmed Swedan. But the name Ahmed Swedan doesn't mean anything to the FBI. Without additional information, the truck has taken them as far as it can go. Investigators will have to look elsewhere for leads. Thankfully, they can rely on the righteous anger of the Kenyan people. This is an attack on Kenya, and most of the victims are Kenyan. And every law enforcement officer in Kenya wants to get to the bottom of this. It is unacceptable. Now, the Kenyan police come into their own. We are the natives, so we understand our people, and we understand their behavior better. Peter Mbuvi is the deputy director of CID in Nairobi. His people have to find this bomber quickly. But he knows it'll be nearly impossible. How can he track down an anonymous fugitive in this melting pot of almost two million people? Luckily, he has the Kenyan public on his side. Mainly, I think the Kenyans were very disappointing because here are just innocent Kenyans who have lost their lives for no apparent reason at all. So we started getting very good information from members of the public. One lead comes from the most unlikely of places, the local hospital, called the MP Shah. There, a janitor mopping the hospital bathrooms makes an unusual discovery. He finds three bullets hidden in a toilet. The bullets have been carefully filed down to fit a 380 caliber pistol. Suddenly, the piece of gun slide that Don's team found at the scene has meaning. It belongs to a 380 caliber Beretta automatic. Our firearms experts can't say that these bullets were in that gun, but I still think it's a pretty compelling piece of evidence to say that this man had these bullets with him and that we did find a gun that they could have fit into. It's a tenuous lead, but investigators are alerted to any suspect who may have visited the MP Shaw on the day of the bombing. A few days later, Kenyan police get a tip that leads them to a local hotel. When they arrest the man in his room, they find a hospital admissions card with the pseudonym Khalid Saleh, showing that he was treated at the hospital where the bullets were found. We were convinced that we have got the right person. Yeah. No one knows who this man is, but an eyewitness positively identifies him as the terrorist who fled the scene of the bombing. Under interrogation, he confesses to his part in the plot. He's one of a pair of suicide bombers trained in Pakistan for the attack on the Nairobi embassy. One of his many names is Al-Awali, and this is what the FBI calls him. He was the passenger in the truck that was driven by another terrorist named Azam, who detonated the bomb. Al-Awali's key job was to force the guards to open the gate by threatening them with a pistol. Azam would then drive the truck as close to the embassy as he could before setting off the bomb. And if Azam failed, Al-Awali would throw a grenade into the back of the truck. But Alawali was just a foot soldier. In his confession, he tells them the name of the organization that recruited him and planned the bombing. Al-Qaeda. In 1998, Al-Qaeda is still a relatively unknown organization, and its leader, Osama bin Laden, has yet to be elevated to the status of public enemy number one. Osama bin Laden was not well known at that point, and Al-Qaeda was known among people in the intelligence business and in the Department of State as a financer of terrorist operations, not as a perpetrator of terrorist operations. But U.S. intelligence was wrong. In February 1998, Osama bin Laden issued a fatwa stating that it was the duty of all Muslims to kill Americans in any country they could. 
Al-Qaeda was going on the offensive. Now the FBI is hunting for an Al-Qaeda cell operating in Nairobi. They have the foot soldier who carried out the bombing, but they still need to flush out his leaders, the men who planned the terrorist act. As Alawali is taken into police custody, another tip leads investigators to an unlikely location, an exclusive suburban development on the outskirts of Nairobi known as Runda Estates. Don's team is sent to the scene. If they can find bomb residue in the house, it may provide the crucial link between Alawali and the bomb site. Walking into the front door of Rundu Estates, the first thing I notice is the smell. It's the smell of cleaning fluid. Someone has gone through this place and tried to clean it from top to bottom, but they didn't clean everywhere. They certainly didn't clean the tops of the doors. So that's the place we go to for our swabs. Don's team recovers evidence from a number of imaginative places that the terrorists obviously forgot to clean. They seal it in airtight bags and ship it to FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. It'll take FBI chemists months to sort through all this data, looking for forensic proof to back up Alawali's confession. Meanwhile, another question remains. The target of the bomb was the American Embassy. So why was the Ufundi building brought down with such devastating loss of life? The Ufundi building next door had nothing to do with the Embassy. It was a civilian building, and not specifically designed to withstand the blast of a massive explosion. When the driver of the truck detonated the bomb, the full force of the blast tore through the building, collapsing its interior walls and crumbling the structure. Unlike the Ufundi building, the embassy was able to withstand the blast of the bomb, and it stayed structurally intact. But the blast wave still shattered its windows and swept through the back of the building, destroying everything in its path. This never should have happened. According to US State Department regulations, all embassy buildings should be built with a standoff zone of 100 feet to safeguard against the blast of any terrorist bomb attack. Tests have shown that the force of an explosion gets progressively weaker as its blast wave spreads out from the bomb. But the Nairobi embassy was built before these regulations came into force. If it had been the recommended distance away, the blast wouldn't have caused so much internal damage. And if the gate had been set 100 feet away from all other buildings, the explosion might not have been strong enough to demolish the Ufundi building either. Now the FBI knows that an Al-Qaeda cell is operating in East Africa. They've caught the man who carried out the bombing, but the men who recruited him are still at large. The forensic evidence being analyzed in Washington has to provide a link to these men before they strike again. Seconds from disaster will The FBI is looking for a forensic link between the bomb maker's den at Runda Estates and the scene of the bombing in Nairobi. At the FBI labs in Washington, the chemists put the material through a spectrometer and conduct a variety of chemical analyses. This allows them to separate the elements and say definitely what chemical traces are in the residue. They find traces of TNT, another commercial explosive called PETN, and aluminum in the residue, the same elements found in samples from the site of the bombing. I've seen that before. There are some recipes out there that call for the addition of aluminum to other explosives as a way to make the charge hotter and more deadly. This provides the final forensic confirmation of Alawali's testimony. It will allow the FBI to make an airtight case against the bomber and two of his accomplices. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day and by following the evidence uncovered during the investigation, we can finally reveal how Al-Qaeda carried out its first major international terrorist act, the Nairobi American Embassy bombing.
August 2nd, 1998. Five days to disaster. Al-Qaeda terrorist Alawali arrives in Nairobi. He's met by his guardian, who drives him to the bomb maker's den at 43 Runda Estates. Here, the bomb makers put the final touches on the bomb. Four days to disaster. Azam arrives from an Al-Qaeda training camp in Pakistan. He will drive the fatal truck. Three days from disaster, Alawali scopes out the embassy. August 7th, 1998. 54 minutes to disaster. The truck leaves 43 Runda estates, loaded with three tons of explosives mixed with aluminum. Alawali carries a pistol inside his jacket to threaten the guards and has four stun grenades on his belt, which he must use to clear the area and blow up the truck if Azam fails. Azam tells him his jacket will get in the way of the grenades, so Alawali takes it off. 29 minutes to disaster. The truck reaches the final roundabout and turns onto the street where the embassy is located. It drives down the road and swerves into the embassy compound where it screeches to a halt in front of the drop barrier. Alawali leaps out of the truck to threaten the guards, but in his haste, he's forgotten his jacket and pistol. Unable to threaten the guards, he can do nothing but shout at them. When they refuse to open the gate, he runs back to the truck and tells Azam to use the gun. With the plan spiraling out of control, Alawali hurls his stun grenades in all directions. The noise from the compound attracts attention from surrounding buildings. Local office workers flock to the windows to see what's going on. Alawali panics and makes a run for it. The force of the explosion shatters all the windows within a three block radius. Thousands of people suffer serious injuries because the noise of the grenades has attracted them to the windows. The bomb blast rips through the Afundi building next door, demolishing its interior walls and bringing it crashing down. As the dust settles, more than 4,000 people are injured and another 213 are dead. 12 of them Americans. In Tanzania, 11 additional people are killed and 85 injured. Alawali survives the bombing, but sustains injuries to his back. Dazed, he hobbles away from the bomb site to the hospital. There, he disposes of any incriminating evidence. He is arrested five days later. <sighs> Alawali and three other accomplices are tried in the U.S. and convicted. George Memba testifies at their trial. What upsets him most is the lack of remorse shown by the terrorists. I think there's something wrong. There's something deeper to what we see happening. And I wish somebody could just go down to the root and find out. Why? For Prudence Bushnell, one of the tragedies of these bombings is that their warning wasn't properly heeded. We just didn't learn enough about how Al-Qaeda operates and the intensity of their hatred toward us and the willingness to take extraordinary measures to kill Americans. Three years later, that hatred would be seen in a shocking, unprecedented attack. When U.S. intelligence fails to heed the signs that Al-Qaeda would strike at the heart of the country, the result is catastrophic. A memorial now stands on the grounds of the new U.S. Embassy, which has been built on the outskirts of Nairobi. 
The lessons learned from 1998 mean that all new embassies conform rigorously to U.S. State Department safety parameters. The site of the old embassy has been converted into a memorial park. It reminds us that the unsung heroes of the war against terror are ordinary people like George Mimba, people who harmed no one.